What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is January 19th of 2021. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And in today's video, we've got to spend some time to talk about Ethereum breaking up over 10% to over $1,400 per coin, its highest level in over three years. Now, I know that this has left a lot of people with questions. Many are curious, are we breaking the all-time highs today? I'll talk about that as well as diving in to what we'll expect afterwards if we do. Are we expecting a correction soon or are we expecting further follow through all the way up towards a big even level like $2,000 per coin here in the next week or so. We've got lots of things to discuss as well as a sponsored review of Wing Finance, a really interesting DeFi protocol. So stay tuned. You won't want to miss that. And all that we're going to be talking about today, guys, let's go ahead and dive straight into it. Now, taking a look over the last 24 hours here, we can not only see Bitcoin is up over the last 24 hours, but the broader cryptocurrency space is doing phenomenally well. For example, Ampleforth, our second top recommendation here for the year of 2021, up over 27%. 43.6% here for the overall week. And we've got a ton of other pro projects as well. Engine Coin, which is actually one of our top picks for 2020, up 27%. Uma, 19%. Terra, Litecoin, Ethereum, Reserve Rates, Neo. A lot of DeFi plays as well as established crypto plays doing phenomenally well in double digit territory. It's just more further signs here that we're in the early stages of the altcoin cycle. And that's really time to start paying attention to what's going on in the market here. Now, we got to talk here about Ethereum first and foremost. So over the last couple of weeks, Ethereum has already been doing phenomenally well. It was generally consolidating around this range, around $600. And over the course of just a couple of weeks, it's more than doubled here up towards $1,370 here. After already taking a pretty stark dip here in the market, we've had buyers come back in, setting in those higher lows, still taking profits in at lower highs. And now we had the coil in on the wedge. We had that moment, the catalyst moment and the breakout that led prices higher here up over 9% at the current moment. So this is really exciting stuff, guys. And I wanna just take some time to answer this question here that's on everyone's mind. Are we breaking all time highs here today or over the next 24 hours? I think we are, guys. Uh, this is a very, very big moment for Ethereum as a cryptocurrency. And as we've been able to not only see such parabolic growth here over the last few weeks, but really recover. And I, I just want to take a step back here because I don't think many people are really doing this. A lot of people don't look at the long-term timeframes. They don't obsess over it like we do. Take a look at this chart here, guys. Ethereum has had an absolutely phenomenal year in 2020. We went from around 80 to to $100 per coin at the absolute bottom. And the absolute moment of peak fear in the market with COVID and the financial markets collapsing back in March of 2020, now to a, towards a point here where Ethereum is leading the market. It's outpacing Bitcoin in this already overwhelmingly positive market. And now we're testing back towards a level we haven't seen in over three years. What a comeback story. And I have to say something, guys, because, you know, I'm, I'm someone who, for example, I call out where I make wrong calls. And a lot of that is why I like to champion when I do make right calls. At the end of the day, one thing that we did do on the channel and on the dashboard is we talked at a moment when no one was bullish on Ethereum. Everyone was doubtful and we thought that this was going to be the double bottom that breaks and Ethereum uh, inevitably collapses. We were confident that $80 to $100 Ethereum was a golden range. It was a golden opportunity in the market. And I'm so happy that during this whole time and stuff, we continue to build on Ethereum. We built Digifox, which was a smart wallet in the Ethereum ecosystem. And we continue to support what's going on in the DeFi space as it just gets more and more exciting with all the applications being built. So again, to all of you who remain patient on it, hats off, congratulations. I think you guys deserve it. Now, the important question we have to ask ourselves here is, you know, in this case, okay, we're going to be breaking through the all-time highs. Can we expect in this case that we're going to be able to get enough follow-through to test towards another big even level like $2,000 per coin? And are we going to see it sooner rather than later? I'm not trying to be a permable or overtly optimistic, guys, but I think it's actually very possible we see this. So why is this? Well, we got to talk about a few different things. We got to take a look at the technicals and this into price action. We got to talk about the fundamental demand for Ethereum. And also the narrative that's driving Ethereum. Why are people interested in Ether as an asset, the native currency of the Ethereum network? Let's go ahead and talk about it. So first off here, we got a few charts that we need to take a look at here. The first one here is taking a look here at the logarithmic long-term uh, chart here for Ethereum. There's a few key things we can take away from this. First off, in the shorter term overall, we can see here that Ethereum against Bitcoin in this case, and that's the chart we're looking at. We're not looking at it against US dollars. We need to see if it's outpacing Bitcoin here to see whether or not we should be fundamentally bullish on holding Ethereum versus just holding Bitcoin. 
we can see here that since back here in 2019 and September and October when we flipped bullish on altcoins, we can see here that we've been setting in higher lows each and every time we have a rally and a pullback, higher lows here against Bitcoin. And we've also been setting in a pattern of higher highs here, right? So if history repeats itself here, generally speaking, what we should see is a breakthrough against these um, these relative highs here. So in this case, we're looking for it to break above this line here on the chart. And that leads us probably towards a big even of 0 0.045 or 0 0.05 uh, ETH uh, to Bitcoin in this case. So basically what this means is that if one Ethereum coin in this case will generally in the next week or two get towards a point where it's at 4.5 to 5% of the price of Bitcoin. So it's a general way you can kind of look at these kind of ETH to BTC ratios, but it's very, very important to keep in mind the ratios and how it's outperforming major cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And we've seen the momentum is here, guys. The volume is here. The movement after this pretty stark correction in Ethereum came back with immense buy side pressure, and it's happening much faster than we saw on the sell side. So again, this is showcasing the kind of FOMO and excitement around Ethereum. And if we take a look at the broader altcoin space here, guys, we're seeing the follow through here in the market. Altcoins found support on their market dominance against previous support in the past. And now we've had a widening range of resistance that gives us more room of growth for altcoins. And with Ethereum on the long-term chart here, building higher lows for support, lower highs here for the point of resistance, building in a massive multi-year wedge and over four year wedge in the making. I think we're about to see our catalyst breakthrough. And I'm very, very excited to see what happens when we get above this descending line of resistance here. What happens when we break above that point? Where is Ethereum gonna to go to against Bitcoin? I think $2,000 per ETH coin in the next couple of weeks is really conservative, guys, to just be honest with you all. Because when things start going vertical in the altcoin cycle, they start going vertical. Now that's one element of this. That's the technical analysis here, the price action. What else do we have? We have the fundamental narrative here. What's going on in the decentralized finance market? Now you all know again with Digifox and all the other things, and I've been talking about DeFi before there was even a term for it with plays like Kyber Network and Salt Lending. There's all these kind of early stages that kind of showcase there was a proposition for DeFi. For those who don't know, DeFi is all about building traditional financial services in a decentralized way or in a permissionless way that gives access to pretty much everyone across the world with an Ethereum wallet. And the really great thing about it is we just broke over a big even level of $25 billion in total locked value as the price of Ethereum has definitely led to most of the appreciation here in this secondary cycle. But what's great to see above all is if we really actually look at the actual locked up assets here in DeFi protocols, you know, lending protocols, um, you know, as well, the platforms like Uniswap that are decentralized exchanges or automated market makers, we can see here that in this case, DeFi has been able to capture a large amount of ETH and actually hold it. We've been setting these higher lows again and higher highs here, and now it looks like we might be setting up here for the next cycle of Ethereum to cycle in to the DeFi space as more and more people become aware of DeFi as a narrative and as a protocol overall. In this case, offering all these valuable propositions, 7 million Ethereum locked up in DeFi. Now, this is important as well because having Ethereum locked up in the DeFi protocols also changes the supply and demand dynamics. So this leads us into our third part here. We need to understand how much ETH is being staked or held in this case as an investment or being utilized in DeFi protocols, which does mitigate potential sell side pressure and also limits the supply, which when we see buy side pressure can drive up prices even higher. So we've got 7 million locked up here. We've got millions of ETH staked and ETH 2.0 coming up here very soon, which I won't even have really the time to talk about in today's video. We've talked about it before on the channel, but the next upgrade for the Ethereum network, which is also drying up supply. And then we've got the real question here. When do we see the big dogs come in and start acquiring chunks of Ethereum? As Ethereum's price rises similar to Bitcoin, we're gonna start getting some more institutional or traditional market interest in Ethereum. We already have seen it over the last couple of years. Grayscale, in this case, for example, through its uh, Ethereum ETN or exchange traded note product, ETHE, has not added any ETH since back here in early December. What happens when they start adding in to this fund here, when they start adding uh, more ETH to this overall exchange traded note product? That's what I'm waiting to see here. I'm waiting to see what happens when we start getting institutional size capital in Ethereum. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we've seen it just yet. And again, 
it's not only just a question here of what happens with Ethereum. This is why, again, I think that two to $3,000 Ethereum here in the next couple of weeks and stuff, something crazy and parabolic could easily happen, right? What I'm curious about as well is taking a look at what's going to happen in the DeFi space. Because we've already seen over the last seven, seven days here a variety of plays up more than 20, 30, 50, 100% here. Very few plays down here in the red. What happens when you get that new wave of liquidity and excitement for altcoins? What happens when people start to realize that, like myself the other day and stuff, when I was worried about Bitcoin dipping and stuff and possibly weighing down altcoins, that we're on the altcoin cycle now, guys. And we're in the early stages of it. We got a long way to go until we reach that line of potential resistance. So, anyways, guys. That's it for me today in regards to rambling about Ethereum. I want to go ahead and dive into the sponsored review of Wing Finance, which is aiming to, at the end of the day, be able to bring about actual credit measurements into the blockchain ecosystem, into DeFi. And I really think you guys are going to find an interest in the project. So let's go ahead and dive into the sponsored review. Alrighty, everyone. So in today's sponsored review, we're going to be taking a look over an interesting project known as Wing Finance, a cross-chain credit-based DeFi platform built on top of the Ontology blockchain. Now, as with most intros, that was a mouthful, but you probably picked up on some key terms such as the Ontology blockchain that many of you are probably familiar with as there's projects like NEO that we've covered here on the channel that are very closely tied with the Ontology ecosystem. And then also terms like DeFi or decentralized finance, which I'm a very big fan of personally as finance really seems to be the best utility application for blockchain networks. But I wanna go ahead and just cut to the chase here and talk about why Wing Finance seems like an interesting project and why we'd consider them as a sponsor here on the video. And the reason being is because that they're tapping into an area within the DeFi space that I'm very intimately passionate about, and that's taking DeFi into the real world and exploring under collateralized loans. So there's really two major services that we're gonna talk about here that Wing Finance offers and how they utilize the ontology blockchain with its digital uh, identification technology to me seems really interesting. It's kind of one of the key selling points why I think the protocol is quite interesting. Now, before we dive into those services, just want to give a bit of context. Ontology has been around, in this case, for some time, but Wing Finance, which we're talking about today, uh, really released its white paper back in September of 2020. And I have to say, as a project that's just not solely in Ethereum, to have reached over $100 million in assets under management is quite impressive for just the last couple of months. So I want to go ahead and dive into why liquidity would be moving over, why value would be moving over to Wing Finance. So there's really two technologies here that are built within the Wing Finance platform. You have the inclusive pool, which is tapping into some of this work within the digital identity space and being able to borrow with less collateral than what you're borrowing. And outside of that as well, the flash pool, which is more akin to the traditional, uh, you know, kind of lending and borrowing functionality that you find within a lot of different kind of maybe Ethereum based protocols like compound finance. All right. So let's go ahead and just kind of dive into these. I want to go ahead and take a look at them directly, and then we'll maybe dive into some documentation here. Now, first off here, let's go ahead and pull up the flash pool. Now, the flash pool here is what you're going to be much more familiar with if you've explored the world of DeFi. This is your traditional, um, for example, depositing or lending of assets to the protocol, being able to earn some type of yield on your assets while on the other end, providing the opportunity for yourself or someone else to be the borrower on the protocol as well. So uh, by locking up collateral in this case, locking up maybe your favorite assets like stable coins, or more specifically, usually it's gonna be digital assets like wrapped Bitcoin or Ethereum, some type of crypto asset that has a volatile nature to it, but still has some kind of market value, utilizing that as collateral in order to borrow usually stable coins, right? Or other cryptocurrencies that you would use for trading. This is what Wing Finance's flash pool is, right? So this gives you the ability here, in this case, you can see here the, there's a total amount of assets applied, almost nearly 100 million here within just the flash pool itself. You have the total amount borrowed, which is 57 million here. The total amount insured here, uh, in this case, and then also the total wing locked, which is the native token of the protocol. But I wanna go ahead and dive straight to the bottom here. This is kind of really what matters here. 
Overall, when you're looking to deposit assets to earn interest within DeFi, you're gonna notice that the rates are a lot higher. And the reason being is because, in this case, within the DeFi protocols, what we're finding now is two things. One, there's a lot of demand to borrow at the moment, especially if you own stable coins. And second off as well, this is basically allowing people to get instant access to credit, instant access to stable coins if they lock up their collateral. There's no need for credit checks, there's no wait times. And because of this, people pay a pretty decent rate here, especially with the existing supply out there. And this is why, you know, for example, pretty much all DeFi protocols offer this ability to earn interest to some degree, much higher than what you get through a traditional commercial bank. But what's really interesting about Wing here, so you have two things. First off, you have some really great rates here. In this case, in the case of Tether, you get 15.6%. This is higher than uh, the vast majority of DeFi protocols out there at the moment. So you can basically get a PUSDT, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, that allows you to basically put up your Tether into the protocol and earn 15.6% annually at the current rates. Now bear in mind, they are variable, just like traditional savings accounts in this case, unless you're doing like a, you know, a CD in this case, you're not gonna get a fixed rate. But outside of this, you also have thing, uh, the secondary thing here that doesn't come with most traditional DeFi protocols is the uh, basically the yield you're also gonna get on the side in Wing tokens. So Wing Finance that we'll continue to kind of hit on here throughout the video is a very community-oriented project. So the token supply in this case, 80% is going to people who are basically lending assets to the protocol and doing other types of activities within the Wing Finance ecosystem. And then the other 20% is going towards the Wing DAO from the initial generation event of the token, which is gonna be utilized to improve the protocol, self-fund, et cetera. It's the typical kind of DAO model overall. But what's really great about this is that you're getting wing tokens on the side with your typical rate. You don't have to pick to choose either one, right? So this is really nice. In this case, you know, if Wing Finance's price itself is going to go up or down, but either way, you're basically getting free tokens to the protocol in this case by just simply utilizing it over, say, Compound Finance and other traditional protocols. Then you also have your borrowing rates here. So everyone always wonders, it's like, okay, how am I getting this yield here? And, uh, you know, for example, on my Tether 15% or 18% for synthetic USD from the synthetics protocol. Well, it's because someone's paying a higher borrowing rate. And you can also find yourself in this end as well if you wanted to borrow capital. So you lock up, maybe for example, um, uh, P Ren BTC, which in this case is basically a wrapped form of Bitcoin uh, on a poly network, which is what they use in order to generate these P tokens for the protocol. And then overall, you'd be able to go out and borrow some kind of stable coin. Maybe I want to borrow PUSDC or PDI or PUSDT, right? So again, and again, don't get too confused by the P's here. Just think of it as basically a chain towards interacting with ontology, as in this case, you're dealing here with a, a, a basically an interoperable blockchain platform, right? So we're taking in assets from NEO, we're taking in assets from Ethereum, et cetera, right? And that's another thing as well. You can bring in NEO and other types of assets that you traditionally can't get on the Ethereum network, which is really exciting. And that's the whole kind of focus of Ontology as a project is to build that interoperability. So this itself is cool. Like, I mean, I'm just happy to see more than anything. You know, we hear constantly about, you know, other blockchain protocols or other types of interoperable platforms, either trying to challenge the kind of mandate that Ethereum is the ultimate platform or that it's the only platform when, yeah, there are other blockchains out there. And I love to see this kind of growth and development. But this is just one thing that has me a bit interested, right? For me, it wasn't really the selling point with uh, Wink Finance. I think it's a cool feature. What really interests me at the end of the day is the inclusive pool. Now, I know of a few other projects out there in the market that are all pretty much early stage because this is still kind of a new frontier that are exploring actual inclusion of KYC verification and credit checks um, within DeFi protocols. And the reason why this is really exciting to me is because we're going to, with these abilities to do KYC, basically identity verification or credit checks to some degree, in this case, we can start to build separate credit networks that are separate from the traditional world of finance. You might know your FI your FICO score in this case, or um, you know, it's traditional scoring mechanisms that determine your credit worthiness. In this case, we're exploring decentralized forms of credit checks that allow you to interact with DeFi protocols by providing some basic information and also, you know, basically taking in the metadata from your transactions on on chain. In this case, to read your credit worthiness. And being able to take out loans through DeFi protocols under collateralized. So in those previous examples, in this case, like we mentioned here for the flash pool, or in a traditional protocol like compound finance, right? This is one you're probably familiar with. It's one of the largest ones in DeFi and, and the Ethereum blockchain system. 
what you can do now is instead of having a two to one, uh, you know, collateral to loan ratio in this case, right? So you'd have to put up maybe like ten thousand dollars to wrap Bitcoin to borrow five thousand dollars of USDC, right? In this case, you can now, in this manner, start to borrow maybe per se the equivalent of a few hundred bucks. I mean, let's just kind of give a ballpark figure here of a thousand dollars and only have $900 of collateral. Or I think more roughly speaking, I think that the lowest ratio that you can go to in this case, um, there's it's a range generally between 1.1 uh, loan to value. So your loan is now starting to exceed, exceed your collateral, right? Or all the way up to 1.25. So you can basically borrow 1,250 bucks versus the thousand dollars in collateral. That's the general ratio there. Just to get an understanding of these terms, I know it can seem a bit complex sometimes, guys, but overall, that's the general gist of it. You can actually start to provide information utilizing ontologies technology. We can now start to borrow at some pretty fair interest rates here, around 10% across all stable coins. And you can do this, in this case, again, providing a portion of collateral here for what you need to borrow in your favorite crypto assets so you don't have to sell those cryptos. It avoids a taxable event of selling those cryptos in order to get credit in the short term and then you maybe get your money back in the future and buy your Bitcoin. But you also get the price appreciation and depreciation as well, depending on where the assets that you're locking up in collateral end up going at the market. So again, this to me is very exciting. There are not many DeFi protocols, at least any mainstream ones out there that are doing this in a functioning way. But this is the really cool thing about Wing. Now, I not only recommend you guys read in to the documentation here to just kind of understand some of the technicalities of it. You know, if you're interested in the protocol, try with a small amount, you know, just kind of dive into it. But again, like any traditional blockchain protocol, uh, you have explorers here on Ontology. You can explore the individual tokens in this case. And again, most of these, all these P tokens are going through the Poly network, which is what they utilize in order to provide this interoperable experience here where you can onboard different types of assets onto the Ontology blockchain. But the real magic here is the O score. This is Ontology's move into providing their own scoring mechanism for your interactions on chain. And I think that this is really exciting because you now can have this basically, as, as it mentions here, basically a self-sovereign uh, credit score that allows you to basically be able to get access to opportunities throughout a variety of different ecosystems within the DeFi space through the Ontology blockchain. So it's serving as this interoperable place for everything to interact, different types of assets, but also you have the digital identity tied to it that will give you access to a whole range of opportunities within the Ontology ecosystem. So if Ontology continues to build out its blockchain ecosystem, I could see a lot of utility coming from something like the O-Score, and then also really what we've seen here within the inclusive pool just being one of many applications. It might get to the point where you can start to get that loan to value ratio, uh, in this case, uh, even higher in this case, or basically make it where you can borrow more as a portion of collateral. Eventually you might get to a point where it gets so good we can actually put up pretty much nothing. That's what I'm really excited for is this opportunity to really start challenging traditional lending. I mean, that's a massive market. It's it's tens of trillions of dollars in this case. But I'm not saying Ontology is exactly there yet, or in this case, that Wing Finance more specifically is there just yet. I think it's got a ways to go. It's like a lot of other DeFi protocols. These are very early on, and I think that they still have a lot to prove in this case overall. Now, the important thing to understand here is that if you want to get started in all this, you have to convert your tokens over into P tokens. And again, what it's basically doing is it's sending funds to a specific contract on the respective blockchains. So again, you're not like per se um, burning the tokens, you're basically locking them up. It's similar to how USDC is basically a dollar in a bank account, and then you get USDC token. In this case, you're taking your USDC, you're locking it in a contract where it's not going to be used, and then you're getting a PUSDC in this case. So you can see here that the fee is 0.01 ETH. In order to do this, you put in a max amount of USDC that you want to. You connect your MetaMask wallet or the native wallet they have for Ontology through your web browser, and then you simply just go ahead and mint the tokens. Now, it sometimes will take a bit of time, uh, depending on Ethereum network traffic in this case, and sometimes as well as you all know, if you've interacted with the Ethereum blockchain, sometimes you can pay a low gas fee and it doesn't get confirmed. I always recommend, as much as I like to keep gas fees low, uh, in this case, if it's really urgent, if you're moving a lot of money, instead of letting it uh, get stuck with a low um, gas fee, in this case, and having to wait hours, pay a decent gas fee, look into how to do that properly. It's gonna save you a lot of hassle and stress. 
But all in all, I highly recommend you guys look into Ontology because, again, I don't want to spearhead it too much that Wing Finance um, is per se like controlled or owned by Ontology in this case, right? It's a community owned ecosystem. But understanding what kind of things Ontology is building overall will help you understand the vision of projects like Wing Finance and how it's actually broadening DeFi into more real world lending and borrowing. Um, to me, I think that that's really exciting overall to be able to actually start taking loans out where I don't need more Bitcoin than what I'm trying to borrow, right? Uh, or at least a, such a high degree in this case, right? If we can get to a point where I can just provide, in this case, maybe for example, $5,000 of Bitcoin and I can borrow $10,000 of a stable coin. Now that is getting closer and closer towards a world that most people can relate to and is actually accessible and useful for people in the underbanked world or unbanked world. Now, last few things I just want to mention, there's some articles and some content that I recommend you check out. First off, check out some of their Medium articles. This is a December recap they did before the close of the new year, um, going into the new year. In this case, you can actually read about what Wing Finance has been able to achieve, uh, some of the metrics that they've been able to reach and some of the services they offer. But we kind of recapped over the major things that Wing Finance does at the moment. But this is just a great place to kind of keep up to date with the project. And last but not least as well, I wanted to dive a little bit into the token here. You know, for me, when it comes to DeFi protocols, I'm really not too nitpicky about how the token metrics look. I do care in this case, above all more than anything, about where the allocation is going. And I'm a big believer in this kind of whole kind of new, uh, kind of fair launch model in this case. Again, fair launch is kind of a subjective term, uh, depending on how it's done and what people look for in a fair launch. For me, I wanna make sure above all that there's not too much inflation initially for the currency in this case, meaning that all the tokens are generated in like the first few weeks. And outside of that as well, I wanna make sure that it's going to the community and the actual users of the protocol. That's the most useful way that a token can be distributed in order to actually incentivize growth. And that's exactly what Wing Token actually does. Now, again, I only want to talk about this. And I usually don't spend time talking about the token because I like their distribution mechanism here. As first off, the total supply is 10 million Wing. So again, just only 10 million coins. And you can see here that the release schedule is not only over a decent amount of time. So over the next three years, a little over in this case, about it's about, generally speaking, nearing about half the supply here is going to be released in three years. So again, you can see your total released wings almost near around 5 million after three years. So it gives that good runway where the early adopters can have a chance. And outside of that as well, it gives people who are later to the uh, kind of race here and participating with wing, still giving them a chance here to participate with it. And that's again, we'll have to see if wing can really kind of sustain itself in the long term and still continues to build and stand out against other DeFi protocols. This distribution mechanism should work quite well. And outside of that as well, 80% going to people who are interacting with it and 20% going to the DAO here, the community fund, where it can be you know, utilized to do all types of different things with uh, increasing uh, you know, kind of the utility of the protocol, et cetera. So we've dove into pretty much all that we have to talk about here today in regards to Wing. I, like I mentioned again, there's a lot of different documentation talking about the Flash pool, talking here about the inclusive pool and how it utilizes the O score. But that's a general kind of surface level overview of what Wing Finance really offers. If you guys want to find out more information on it, you can check out the link down below in the description. But that's going to be it for me today here from the Data Dash channel, guys. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day wherever you are. If you like this video, please consider dropping a like as always. And I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.